The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone, welcome to The Stoa. That song was Dark Force Joggers, by the way. Um, so this is another uh, edition of the Chapel Perilous. <clears throat> this is uh, the third session in a four-part series. Uh, and then the next one uh, next week is right before the maybe the end of the Stoa party. Um, and the series is based off a comic book uh, thingy that Rebecca and I uh, created uh, and has four chapters. Uh, the first one was The Edge, uh, the second was The Descent, and this one is The Dark Forest. And we are in The Dark Forest now. Um, and I'll pass it to Rebecca so she can kind of explain a little bit more about what this thing is of The Chapel Perilous. You're on uh, mute, Rebecca. Hey everyone, <laughs> it's really good to see you all. Um, yeah, so I'll just say a little bit about Chapel Perilous overall and then we'll get into the details of the dark forest as we go forward. Um, so Chapel Perilous is our little corner of the stoa where we train to face the uncertainties of the world. We're trying to push the boundaries of who we are and how we think. And the reason why we started this whole thing is because I realized, as I think many people have realized lately, that I'm not very good with uncertainty. And I started seeing this problem of not being able to tolerate uncertainty. Um, it just seemed to explain so many things in my personal life. But then also when I started looking at my friends' lives and people online, seeing these things of people getting trapped in these sort of, you know, you could call them echo chambers, you could call them sort of um, ideologies, mimetic tribes, people getting trapped, unable to, to think outside their, their kind of passing various memes around and kind of being trapped there. And, I think that that is due to a desire for certainty and that's why you stick with what you know and with the people and with the ideas and memes that you know. And then there's also obviously as a sort of roll on from that people being dicks to each other on the internet because they're so certain that their little tribe is right about everything. And so can't tolerate uncertainty that they they latch onto a certain certainty, a certain certainty, and, and then try and force it on other people. And then the other thing that I think, and maybe this is a bit of a leap, but um, we've been discussing it throughout the sessions, is this, I, this idea of the meaning crisis or like people feeling lost and uncertain about what life means and what they're supposed to be up to. I suspect that that might also be a result of not being able to tolerate uncertainty and searching for like a grand meta certainty that explains everything. So anyway, I've got this, this, this idea of this root problem of an, of an intolerance of uncertainty. I start looking up, looking at the literature, and I find that psychologists have thought about this too. And it's actually considered a causal factor for all sorts of um, mental illnesses, particularly generalized anxiety disorder. And it, it's, it's not just the psychologists and the scientists who are talking about this. You've also got it all over wisdom tradition. So in Zen Buddhism, they talk about the importance of facing the great doubt, of facing uncertainty to reach in, enlightenment. So chatting about with this, this with Peter, we realize we need a place to train to face uncertainty. And that's why we're doing what we're doing. And that's why we're venturing into the dark forest this evening or this morning, I suppose, for many of you. Um, and today we're really lucky to have Yancy here to chat about it all with us. So I'll pass it over to Peter to start that chat. Yeah, and so we have our friend back at the Stoa, Yancy Strickler. Uh, Yancy is the co-founder of Kickstarter, former music critic, uh, and his music game is like spot on. Uh, and he's the author of This Could Be Our Future. Uh, he also wrote this article called uh, The Dark Forest Theory of the Internet that like everyone, like at least in my circles, is still talking about today. It went, went like super viral. Um, and we're just gonna use that article and the idea of the dark forest that he presented uh, as a prompt to get into all sorts of weirdness. Um, so before I take in Yancey, how today's gonna to work, uh, the first 45 minutes is a conversation between Yancey, uh, Rebecca and myself. And then if you have any questions, just throw them in the chat. I'll call on you, you can mute yourself, ask your question to Yancey. And then we'll take a break and then we'll do the 45 uh, workshop component about uncertainty and then the record button will be uh, turned off. Um, so yeah, that being said, uh, Yancey, welcome back, my friend. Yeah, ni nice to see you, Peter, uh, Rebecca, and nice to see everyone here. I see two members of the Bento Society community I'm a part of who are also here this morning. So Jamie and Sherry, what's up? Uh, but yeah, I love the Stoa. Uh, you know, I had a prepared question, but I'm, I'm curious, anything that Rebecca or I said prompted anything in you? Yeah, actually, um, 
uncertainty, you know, right before we turned on the camera, I asked Peter, is next week really the end of the STOA? He keeps <laughs> pitching this maybe the end of the STOA party. And, um, and, just, and just brought up something I've been thinking about as someone who's been running a, a, a largely online community the past year, which is just the real uncertainty as we, especially in North America, leave, you know, COVID um, maybe this year. And a lot of the things that we've built, it's, it's not clear what meaning they will have. And I keep reflecting on that when the lockdowns began, there was so much clarity and certainty about what we all must do. And now as they're ending, uh, potentially ending in some, in some parts of the world, there is, yeah, just a, a real lack of clarity about what's supposed to happen. And, and in a way seems like it's more celebratory, but is, is difficult in a different kind of way. Um, so just, just thinking about uncertainty and our conversation earlier, just, just reflecting on those things. Yeah, yeah, I totally, totally feel that. Um, so maybe it'd be good just to give people a brief summary on the dark forest, um, the theory uh, that you wrote the article. Um, and if I recall, the idea was that because of like, you know, ads, uh, you know, tracking from surveillance, capitalism, being trolled, cancel culture, all this cultural noise, people were retreating from the public square of the internet, like the Twitters uh, of the world to provide like psychological kind of and reputational safety. Uh, so they're going to like private forums, uh, private Slack groups, like the dark forests of the internet. And the Stoa is kind of like, and I imagine maybe your group too, is sort of like a dark forest or an in between the dark forest and the public square. Um, and you ended uh, that article with kind of a cryptic warning that, uh, you know, there's so many eyeballs there uh, that are going to be potentially capitalized by actors that don't have people's best interests in mind. And so there could be an ethical duty for us to be authentic in the public square and not just retreat to the dark forest. Um, and that was written in May uh, 2019, so almost two years ago. So I'm curious, it's still like, like people are still talking about, like I, as I mentioned. Um, so any kind of reflections or any kind of like, how how's that article or that concept sit with you now, and how the things have evolved since then? Yeah, you know, I reread it um, last night for the first time in you know over a year, and um, I didn't. I totally remember writing it. I mean, parts of it I do, parts of it I was like, oh, this person seems more certain than I feel, and um, how they talk about things. Interesting, um, but you know, for me, it started from. You know, I've, I've been an online person my whole life. Um, I was a message board person in, in high school and, you know, college and 20s. I blogged every day uh, for many of the 2000s. So I'm like a default internet person. And I had this reflection that, um, I, like, I know who I am in the world. Um, and I'm like a self-confident person, reasonably so. But that online, I feel just extremely awkward. And I don't know how to be myself. And I feel like I, I may be used to know how to be myself, uh, but I don't know how to be myself anymore. And to some degree, this is about age and about having things at stake. And like, you know, because I did Kickstarter, then there's like a different, you know, things I do have different meaning or, you know, there, there's that kind of stuff that's a part of it. But to a large degree, uh, I, I just felt like the, these main channels are dangerous and that the basically that the, the potential downsides of the of really engaging in the main social media channels, the potential downsides might exceed the upsides in a lot of ways. Because uh, well, what it does to your mental health to like truly engage in a deep way on these platforms, um, you know, you, you, you post all of your, your best jokes, and you know, maybe you get canceled, or maybe even worse, no one thinks you're funny, and you do you and you find that out. <laughs> Uh, but there's a, a, lot, a lot of interesting costs that you face. And, and I felt like for me, if I just reflected on my own experience, what it made me wanna do was just to, to disengage and, and to really to pull back and to not show myself in, in those places. And so that original piece is just talking about sort of that tension and reflecting that, like I do think there's something lost by me not being myself online but I also think that like I face a real risk in doing that. And, and maybe the smart choice is to not show yourself. And that's what more and more of us are doing. Now, I wrote like a second, a follow-up piece to that like a week later where I like talked about ways I was trying to be 
more of myself on the internet. And, uh, and I was forcing myself to like tweet once a day and to not tweet about professional things and you know things like that. And I, I did embark on that project for a while, but I think at this point, I am probably farther into the forest than ever before. And, and for a variety of different reasons. But I, I did, I did push, push back on that. And I really want to challenge myself that like, I don't, I don't know that I, you know, I think what I'm describing is accurate, but like, should I go along with the flow of this? And, and I think in a way, I just felt like the, the effort of that um, didn't feel worth it. Be, I think fundamentally because of who I am, maybe not because of a, a, any larger issue. I wonder if, um, I don't know if this is true, but I get this sense that the concern about authenticity, it feels like quite a modern concern because it's not, I mean, obviously we're talking about online, but in generally people have been talking about trying to be more authentic for, I don't know, the last, let's say 20 years, quite a lot in self-help books and, and stuff like that. I just wonder, do you think that is something about like the modern condition, what it is to live in this time, or is it a perennial concern that we're just actually getting the guts to speak about now? I think it's probably a reaction of so much being inauthentic makes authentic more valuable. Like, you know, uh, someone I interviewed said this to me recently that our, our brains evolved to identify a cat at a time when if we saw a cat, there would actually be a cat there. And there was no representation of a cat. And now, we see way more representations of cats than we see cats. And so what, you know, how do we determine what is authentic or, so I think, I think a little bit of is it's a reaction to just what is around us. Um, I think it's also a reaction to, you know, what is defined as authentic. I mean, there are some things that like supersede the moment, but to a large degree, I think what is defined as authentic is like how well you do at using the current mean internet voice to express, you know, to express whatever. But like the, this, the same idea could be expressed by the same person, two different ways, one with like very internet aware language and one with non-internet aware language. And one will feel much more authentic than the other. So mm -hmm. I think a little bit of it is, um, you know, because say Twitter has become such a default broadcast platform, like it, it flattens all information and, and it forces all information to flatten itself into what's going to get a retweet. And so it just, it, it, it forces, it, if we are to imagine that our ultimate audience, if there is like a, a larger audience that is to be found through that channel, then of course we can toward ourselves to that idea of authentic. But this is where I feel like one of the best developments in um, the emotional relationship to social media has happened in the, just the past month or two as the word thirsty has become predominant. I think thirsty is an incredibly useful phrase mm -hmm. to like to throw a little dirt on people who are good at the internet uh, and, call, and calling out sort of what that underlying drive is and speaking about it in a way that is recognizable, that like puts it into context that like I find the idea of talking about someone being thirsty for attention and viewing social media as just like the scoreboard of thirstiness as being quite helpful, I think, for maybe asking people to check themselves about what they're doing. Mm. You know, um, to double click on the authenticity piece, it's like one way I hold it is like authoring your life. You know, if you're authentic, you you are authoring your life. And maybe that could be bifurcated. Like, you know, if you're authoring your life in such a way where you're selling yourself, um, it's like, you know, you're presenting yourself as a certain way to people. Maybe that's not the, the type of authenticity mm -hmm. we're looking at, but like authoring your life in such a way where you're discovering yourself. Um, and I'm, I'm just like, I do these daily journals, so journals at the STOA and like, I'm just discovering myself publicly and it feels really authentic and people are vibing with the authenticity there. Um, but it's always like at the knife's edge of being uncertain because you're, you're discovering yourself in front of people and all those emotions come up with that. Um, so I'm curious what, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I would just think, um, you know, I, I think I, I, have, I have behaved that way on the internet before where I discover myself through conversations with self or with conversations through with other people and that is like the web at its best. Um, you know, th the question is, is that 
I think for, for some people, there's a feeling of riskiness. I mean, I, I love how you write, Peter, and, and I do see it as like a riskier form of writing. There are times where I read you and my eyebrows will go up and I'll think, I, you know, I wouldn't have shared that. And, you know, may, does that make me feel old or, you know, like there's a, there's, there's a, it, but it's unexpected. It's unexpected. So certainly I, I notice it, but, you know, I don't, I don't think less of you from that in any way. I probably think more of you in that way. But that's a real, you know, that's a real risk you are taking. And, um, and so I don't know what you feel like the cost benefit of that is, or whether you're just thinking I am, me being authentic is that I just say these kinds of things. How, how would you answer that? Why do you, why do you do that? I don't know. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure it out. I need, I need maybe a couple of more journal entries to the process, <laughs> but yeah, it does, it does feel alive. I like kind of mapping my words to what feels most alive and what feels most true, whether it's speaking right now or in, in, in kind of written format. And then just the encouragement getting from it kind of like, is like, you know, encouraging the process. I mean, I've reached this place that is for someone who's, who is a writer, um, by heart, you know, and, and, and for most of my life, I've reached this point where I, I love to write and I hate to publish. I am, um, I'm publishing very little. And, um, even though I'm writing quite a bit and, you know, earlier this year, I wrote a big thing that I'm very proud of and I didn't publish it because I was proud of it in a way. Cause I thought, I don't know that I want other people to experience, like I, maybe I need to wait a year or something to publish this. Um, and I, I'm, I'm increasingly finding that uh, happening. And there was a, it makes me think of, uh, Jerry Seinfeld was on the Tim Ferriss podcast a couple months ago and he was fantastic. And in talking about emotional self-moderation um, is was like all Jerry talked about. And he has a rule that if he ever has an idea, um, However excited, is he, he, however, however excited he might be about it, he won't share it with another person for at least 24 hours because he needs at least 24 hours for him himself to know what he feels about it. And he also knows that someone else might not get his idea and their reaction might make him feel shitty about something that otherwise he would feel okay with if he had shared it too early. So his whole thing is you never share anything with anyone else until you've sat with it for yourself for 24 hours so you are clear in your own mind what you think and understand about it. In a world where instead we're like, you know, immediately let's see what people think and you tweet it, you're letting the hive mind tell you what you think about your ideas. You're letting the hive mind be your editor rather than you find, find your own truth in what you're doing. So I, I increasingly I find that, yeah, publishing is like, feels like asking for attention. And, and somehow the idea of asking for attention is like this really, to me, it's become something I, I feel really uncomfortable with and, and, and I hate doing it. It's almost like asking for help, that kind of feeling. Um, but the notion that I have to, just by sharing a thought that I have, that I am asking someone to stop something else they're doing, or I'm competing with a thirst seeking someone else, or that I am, that I am somehow like just putting something that, that, I don't know, appeared to me in a state of competition uh, in this arena just feels so incongruous to like what its intention is and what and why I'm doing it. And so more and more, it's made me just not publish things at all. Or, or what I do, I, I lead this group, the Bento Society, which is a kind of a closed community. I mean, not closed, anyone can be a part of it, but, you know, we don't talk about what we do on the internet. But, you know, there I've been designing these um, experiences that are for 10 people in a room together. And, um, and they're, they're like these multi-week experiences. They're like scripts that I write where people play roles and do these different things. And it's like, I, I love it so much. And, you know, I haven't talked about those things at all on the internet because I don't know how to describe that. I don't, know, I don't know how to put that in the language, you know? And so instead I just, I write, but I don't publish. And, and, and I don't know what, I don't know what the end result of that is. Um, but I just find that this notion that I must ask for attention to be, to be one that just increasingly um, doesn't sit well with me. And I mentioned this to a friend of mine who's also a writer who has become a, a successful entrepreneur. And he laughed and was like, yeah, well, of course, we'd all 
don't want to ask for attention, but what choice do we have? And, you know, our conversation kind of moved on because that felt like one of those fatalistically true things that why even, why even try to push back against. But it is interesting to think that we, it does seem like, oh, well, we have to bother each other for attention because we have to, you know, we, we, I, I need my clout to go up. I need your eyeballs on my thing. And that's very strange. I, I don't think I ever would have thought that way at another point in my life, but it does feel like that now. What's strange to me is I feel like that thing that you're describing of, well, asking for attention or like creating a, um, a commodified version of yourself, kind of, that you're presenting online. And, and obviously it's like a shaved down version mm -hmm. of who you really are. Um, because, I mean, even if you were being as authentic as possible, it would have to be because you can't share everything. I, I see that more and more people, um, people who aren't entrepreneurs, people who have normal jobs are still demonstrating that same behavior and when I speak to my friends about it who have you know normal jobs and aren't trying to be people on the internet whatever that means um they still seem to be competing for internet points and I think I was thinking about that um that sort of um point you make in your book in this could be your fu our future your future our future <laughs> sorry uh the idea that there's like this hidden value that influences how all business is done which isn't acknowledged um publicly which is financial maximization yeah. and it's considered to be the only rational way to make choices and i was thinking about that and thinking about like how how people tend to commodify themselves even when there isn't any obvious way that i can see that that is maximizing their, their cash flow yes, right. or whatever. Yeah, so is that something, do you think that's maybe a hidden um, motivation that underlies the financial one or is it like a competing it's a motivation? It's a, new, it's a new competing one, it's a new competing mm. one. Yeah, finance is competing with, with status, uh, I, I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there are, day, <laughs> there are days where I wish like, I wish someone would just publish the list that ranked all of humans so I could just see where I am. You know, I know I'm probably like seven millionth, but I just, if only I could just know. <laughs> someone just tell me, you know? And I think that's like a little bit what the internet, uh, you know, does for us on some days. But, but yeah, you know, I saw a big, you know, a big Twitter name, someone probably most of us here follows, saying something like, you know, anything that isn't, uh, work like earning money you are chasing status and to deny otherwise is like you're being a fool and i just thought that is such a that is such a mirror to what is in that person's soul to think if i'm reading a book it's for status if i'm spending time with someone it's for status if i'm writing something it's for status no but that is the that is the rude assumption of everything we see on the internet right and it's like so how good are you at status chasing um, you know, what is your, what is your art of status getting? And, and so we judge you on that in addition to like, you know, what, what the numbers say. And so I, I think that that is in a way, the core game of the web, um, for a lot of players and, um, you know, the benefits of humanity is that a lot of good things happen as a result of that, you know, the, the competition for status produces, you know, knowledge produces all sorts of other things. Like, I think it's probably a net positive maybe for all of us uh, in the long run, even if it's a, you know, I don't think these are healthy things to participate in in a, in a real way. Uh, so I'll ask one more question, then we'll pivot to the, the chat. Um, feel free to put your questions in. And this, this is, this is, I love this. Um, so like, let's just kind of maybe bifurcate two types of motivation about being an internet person like there's one that are like you know you're, you're competing in the attention economy you want the highs you want the, the highs of the likes and the clout and all that type of stuff and then the other one which i think you and i are kind of pursuing is find the others um like let's put out an artifact out there let's do some kind of like community and it attracts like-minded people so we can kind of go into that dark forest together um, and like just the people in the room, like Hannah, Cheryl, Joe, David, it's like, I wouldn't have uh, met and deepened these relationships if it wasn't for the STOA. Um, and this is awesome. Like we're getting in, you know, communitas with each other. Um, so the beacon was in service of finding the others. And status though, like we had the um, Keith Johnstone, um, the guy who created Impro at the STOA. And uh, I think when we were, you were in Toronto, we were talking about how at Dale Carnegie and I have a status literacy based off my improv experience. And it's really a language you can speak that could be in service of either of those motivations mm -hmm. of the clout chasing or of finding the others. Mm -hmm. um, 
And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll pause there to see if it comes alive for you. Well, you know, I, I did a talk two days ago for a group of people I haven't been a part of before. And I could feel when I was in the Zoom room, just like this, I could, I could feel the competitive environment of it. It was just weird. I could just tell, I could just tell. And somehow when everyone came into this room, I could just feel in my body that it was a different space. And, and, and it was, you know, so there are, there are these sort of implicit values that come with these spaces that we create. And, you know, I think they're often a reflection of, of, of who starts them. Um, I mean, when I think about like the Bento Society, the group that I run, um, which I, you know, has an ambitious mission, I, I care about its work, all these kinds of things. My a big struggle I face is, um, well, I feel almost zero desire to grow it. Like I believe in what I'm doing. I want everyone who it can find utility for to use it. I want it to fit in their life as someone would wish it to fit in their life. But I don't want to ask anybody to do that. And I don't want to market it. And I don't, I just want to be it, you know, I just want it to find its way. And I think that is correct. And it's, and it is doing that and is being healthy in that way. But I, but I'm constantly asking myself in part because I follow on Twitter, other people who run communities that they do hype things a lot. Like, should I be doing more? Is this unsuccessful because I'm not adopting this other language, but you know, what it's made me think about and how I filter things I write and kind of the projects I do now is to think about pursuing a minimal viable audience and like whatever channel I have that has the smallest number of subscribers is where I will feel most open to posting my most interesting thoughts. You know, I have, I have a, I have an email, I have one email list of like 40 people, you know, those people I feel way more, way easier talking to than like larger groups. And instead of you know, wanting to put every idea at its maximum possible output and amplification, I feel a desire to do the opposite. Now, of course, at the same time, I want someone to, you want the, the left field major endorsement, you know, that lets someone care about your piece two years later. Of course, you want those things. But more than anything, I find, I, I just want, I want a feeling of wholeness and not a feeling like I am exposing or asking. I mean, so, so many, so, so often my experience of writing has been feeling immensely proud of something and then feeling bad about myself after putting it out because I will feel like, oh, was I expecting or wanting something? Like, I didn't think I was wanting anything. I was just wanting to explore this thing. But now suddenly I find that that wasn't enough. I feel like, oh, maybe this wasn't a, a successful experiment in some way. So to go back to like that Seinfeld idea of of giving yourself time before you get that feedback. I think that's a little bit maybe what I am working towards. Um, but there's also, of course, just to be clear, there's all the voices that are telling me that I'm being weak and that I'm, you know, I'm just being afraid of failure and, and all those kinds of things, which I think are probably part of it too. Um, but yeah, I, I think that there's a, a, culture, a culture of the web that uh, if, if you enter in the right language, you will be accepted and amplified. And if you struggle to do that, if you aren't very good at it, or if you don't want to do it, it could be a, a, a more painful experience. Yeah, I love that. That tension is real within me and a lot of people. And, you know, I, I know the fame algorithm, I can pursue it, but then there's like this, a lot of ego of noise will just come your way and just kind of corrupt the spirit of what, what you know, you're trying yeah. to create. One, one thing I will ask myself, because I will feel that I will feel that jealousy at times. But then I'll just ask myself, if I like if I wanted to be a big Twitter person, and I know you have to tweet whatever 30 times a day, and you can't ever stop. It's not like you bank that. It's not like you just bank <laughs> that and you're just good now. You can never stop. Like there's zero part of me that wants that life experience. Zero part, like negative, negative, negative part of me wants that life experience. So whenever I have those feelings, I go there and I just think however good it looks like, I don't want, I don't want that. I don't want that. I'm, 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 I'm desiring. I'm made to feel desirous, but I don't actually want that, but I, I have to, I have to remind myself. It's so useful to get that, like, to start thinking more and picking apart 
want and desire and thinking about where they're all come from. Um, I'm going to just tag in Hannah if she's ready to come on mic and ask her questions because she had some really interesting ones popping up in the chat. Hannah, you Hello. about? I am here. <laughs> um, so I had two questions come up listening. The first one is, is there a hidden cost to not publishing where people might be um, potentially really nourished by your writing and they aren't getting that? And the second question is um, the asking for attention thing and uh, the avoidance of that. I feel like for some people that might be connected to things like uh, wanting to avoid getting hurt, like don't stick out, don't be the nail that's sticking out or you get hammered down. Uh, and so I feel like it's not something that should be taken for granted, but something that each person should ask themselves, where is this coming from? And I wonder if you've thought about that. So if either of those topics seems interesting. Yeah, can I, can I just ask, I'd love, can I just ask you, Hannah, like, do you, do you feel you're asked, how do you feel about that question of asking for attention or not? How do you, how do you relate to that? Mm. Uh, to me, I'm the kind of person who, uh, or right now, I'm the kind of person who has a lot of trouble asking for help and uh, sticking out in a needy way. And so perhaps that's why it occurred to me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think there is, there are, there are certainly costs to not publishing. I mean, one, just as a writer, there is the funny feeling of like something written but not published of like, is it done? You know, do you, can I still find that? Where's that doc? You know, there, there is a, there is a sloppiness there that I think can add up. Um, um, you know, the thought of like doing it for others, I tend to avoid those kinds of self arguments because I feel like that I could justify things there or I can make myself feel bigger or, you know, but it, it might be a valid way to think about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think. To me, I think asking for attention, a little bit of it, I think, is fear of failure. It is this idea that I believe something is special, and then I discover other people don't. And then does that affect my own feelings about my own things? Um, so I've had experiences that have made me feel that way. Um, and, and I think there's a part of it that's just like, I don't know, you know, I think again, my personality type is part of it, but just not wanting to play the same game. Um, and just a feeling that if I'm just playing the same game as everyone else, that there is a, there's something lost in that. So, you know, I, I, I say this about like, I'm not writing as much. I've actually published a ton, but I'm now I'm publishing, you know, Q and A's with other people, uh, people who I respect, people who I learn from. And so instead of me offering my words, I'm offering my words through the curation and questions I ask of other people. And, I, and I'm using that. And, and by absolutely part of that is about creating a, a kind of a safety for me, right? It's a, it's a shield in a way. It's not me, it's someone else. Um, and, and, and so I do think there are a number of things that are like defense mechanisms that are a part of that. Um, but, you know, I'm thinking of this as also like, you know, if I do, when I have those moments of publishing, like to make them, to make them worth something. Um, and so to spend more time to not be as, you know, just, just wanting, not wanting to keep a release schedule or something like that, but I, you know, I, I, there's no right or wrong here. Yeah. I have a sense that you're talking about publishing, not for the sake of it, but because it's, it's very aligned with your yeah, because it's alive, because you're ready for it, because, you know, yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, Cheryl just had a question that uh, would be good to take in next. Cheryl, if you're going to meet yourself. Yeah, my question is, what is the relationship or difference between the desire for attention and the desire to be witnessed? That's great. That's great. I mean, that makes me think of like, do you know the concept of donut economics? It's this, this economic theory that um, says that there's like a, 
outer boundary of the world's resources that you don't want to exceed. So like this outer line of a circle. And then there's this inner circle of like human rights that you don't want to go below. And, uh, and so the goal of donut economics is to stay in this equilibrium between like not deficient and not overshooting. And your question, Cheryl, makes me think about there is a, a minimum witnessing that we all need. And maybe that comes in our physical life and our, and our actual life, or maybe that's something that needs to come through our online life. And yeah, and if you don't feel like you have that level of uh, standing, then you, you absolutely, you, you create it. I think maybe for a lot of people, we're, we're trying to meet that minimum witnessing and maybe we discover through trial and error, like there is this maybe overshoot of like, oh, that got a little uncomfortable for me. But maybe that is a better way to think about this is like there is a, a place of standing we are trying to get to. Is that how you're thinking about it, Cheryl? Yeah, there, there's, I mean, there's such an intense resonance right now with everything that you're which is the conversation that's happening. And it's making me think about how there's a quality of just how different it is when you're in a relational space of this kind of authentic witnessing of each other. And yeah, that vibe that you're talking about having entering here versus that other Zoom call that's more competitive. So just thinking about what are the what are what are the qualities of difference in those spaces and how do you cultivate, I guess, more of these circles of witnessing rather than attention speaking seeking. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's interesting to think about like if you think about Clubhouse as a product experience, like as a in a vacuum, Clubhouse is absolutely that kind of great flattening, democratic, we're all you know, there's no status here. It's about who has the, who can talk the best, you know? Um, but what do we see lay on layered over Clubhouse? It's like the crazy bios with the million, the million emojis and touts of all their things and just all the hype, the hype cycle. Um, so you see like the internet, the, the internet culture just coming in, oozing in uh, over what's there. Um, yeah, I think it's, 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 um, yeah, to feel to to have to have, uh, you know, a, a self a self acceptance is like the greatest gift you can have. You know, you can be given or you can discover. And um, yeah. Oh, I see. Um, Margaret has a really good question um, that sort of follows on from this. If you want to come up on mic, Margaret. Sure. Thank you. Um... So yeah, this is similar to the line of inquiry Cheryl had, which is, so earlier Yancy, you said something along the lines that the spaces we create may, they carry implicit values that um, often may stem from the creators of the spaces themselves. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if you can share at all what considerations went into the creation and cultivation of the Bento Society or your other small audience spheres that you mentioned. Yeah, what a great, what a great question. Um, well, to be honest, it's something I probably haven't thought deeply enough about. It's a, it's been very instinctual. Um, you know, just three things that are read aloud at the start of like every bento meeting. Um, uh, one is to be respectful and to accept people for who they are. Don't try to change anyone or fix anyone. We are here to deeply witness each other. Um, second is what happens in bento stays in bento. So this is a safe space for us to explore who we are and we have the right for that not to leave the room. Um, and that finally we all follow the instructions given because they're there to create a safe space for all of us. Um, I think, yeah, I think implicit is just a, um, it's a sense of wholeness. You know, that bento is about identifying different aspects of who you are. And so you are being encouraged to bring those different dimensions and you are, and really what you, I think, see by being a part of it is you see other people do that. A lot of how I've structured these um, sort of smaller group experiences was based on 
studying Weight Watchers and Alcoholics Anonymous and seeing how peer groups work and reading how what allows people to change most easily is seeing a peer change, a peer go through a transformation, someone else going through similar kinds of things, experience some revelation. And that when someone sees someone else do that, it's incredibly meaningful. And that if someone does that and other people are inspired by them, for that person to become a mentor or a role model becomes immensely meaningful to them. And it creates these amazing cycles of kind of everyone stepping up to, to fulfill their best selves. You know, the, the way to think about Alcoholics Anonymous is it's replacing your core group of friends with people who drink instead with people who don't drink. And as a result, you change from that. So I think that there is a, you know, it's a maybe a humanism that it starts with and, and maybe an, an enlightened self-interest. Um, and that it's a non, you know, a non-commercial, non-competitive space. Um, we do get people rolling in with the clubhouse vibes. And, um, and what happens is after one meeting, they just see how, how off they are. And generally that stuff stops. Like people don't try to sell because it's just like, this is, this would clearly be a, a record scratch in this kind of space. But I think, yeah, explicitly writing those things down, Margaret, I haven't, I haven't done that. It's so much been, um, you know, an instinctual kind of personal project done with others that it's been so in conversation that not a lot has been written down in that kind of way. I love, I love, I love that you asked that, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, what's coming to mind when I hear you speak to how this was like a very natural, organic, creative process um, based on what you shared about Weight Watchers and AA, it makes me think a lot about like binding versus cleaving energy. And I hear you speaking to, I think it's the non-competitive aspect of like really inviting people to set aside the maybe classic game dynamics that we're exposed to on the internet at large to find a space where that's just not what's happening um, and really feel into a different way of being. So thank you very much. Can you, I, 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 I can implicitly assume what binding versus cleaving means, but can you talk about like what the difference is between those things? Um, not well, but I'll give it a shot. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is a concept I've heard mentioned by other people and I just also implicitly had an understanding of it and like incorporated it into my mind. Um, but I think of it as almost as like on like an organic chemistry kind of level of that to create relationships, which are a type of bond between beings, um, you need energy that goes into it. And to maintain those bonds, they need like a consistent input and that those bonds can also be cleaved, they can be broken. Mm. Um, so thinking about a commonality of non-competitive spaces is that you're growing bonds with people um, that are meaningful and you're not necessarily thinking about like using the energy inherent in the space to grow or attain more. You're really thinking about um, like meaningful connection mm. as you, you said that like how peer groups function. Um, like non-extractive, non-extractive energy. Yes, yes. Yeah. Cool. So um, we reached our, a lot of time for the first portion. Uh, and in a moment, we'll take a brief break, play some music, and then we'll pivot to the workshop component. And if you want to silently leave during that time, feel free to. But uh, uh, Rebecca has one last question for Yancy. So I'll take in Rebecca. I do. I should probably preface this with an explanation of what, what we're up to. So we always start Chapel Perilous um, with each of us making an offering on the altar of agnosticism, which is simply saying something you don't know, um, just to set the tone and to acknowledge all of our collective ignorance. So if you wouldn't mind starting us off, Yancy, can you tell us something you don't know? It can be big, it can be small. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to be myself online. Is that, is, am I doing that correct? <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. I don't know that's how to do great. this correctly. I, <laughs> I don't know how to do myself online. Yeah. Amazing. So we're going to ask everyone, um, because we have a little bit shorter time for our workshop, can you pop your, um, your I don't knows in the chat um, whilst, whilst we're during the break? And we'll all enjoy looking at them all. You can give a plus one to anyone if you also don't know what they don't know. And yeah, thank you so much for having this conversation with us. I feel like it could have gone on a lot longer.
Yeah, it was great to be with everyone. This is really, you know, the STOA is always special. Um, and I, I thank you, Peter, and thank you, Rebecca. And yeah, great to just be with folks anytime. Beautiful. Thank you, my friend, for coming. Uh, we'll play some music right now. And uh, yeah, feel free to stay, everyone, if you want to um, explore and build a deeper relationship with unknowingness. So we'll take a brief break.